So we're familiar with the idea of transformation, but I'm not talking about just mere physical bodily transformation. I'm talking about spiritual transformation. Paul was worried. You know, you're under this persecution. I'm not there to help steady you, but I'm afraid that, you know, you might get drawn away somehow. And then all that, all that time and effort and energy and relationship, you know, would end up being nothing. Their course was shame and shunning because Christians were accused of being bad citizens of the Roman Empire. In fact, when Rome fell, it was blamed upon the Christians. It's because of you Christians, you turned away from our gods, you didn't take care of them. And so they have turned their backs on us and that has allowed the Roman Empire to fall. That sounds so familiar to me today as I hear modern day evangelists say, well, Americans aren't serving God and he's making America fall, he's punishing America. It wasn't true then, and it isn't true now. Paul and Silas had been run out of the city because they were considered not only bad Roman citizens, but as sort of fermenting unrest. They were causing problems. They were disrupting society. They were gathering around them people, and that disrupted the temple worship, and that disrupted just their everyday life. Now, instead of bricklayers and masons and all the other professions behaving as they normally did, now we got arguments in families and arguments amongst the guilds about, hey, you have to do these things. And so you could be subject to arrest for causing a public disturbance, being a public nuisance. So some of them were probably persecuted by being arrested. So Paul told them, hey, I'm warning you before I go, you will suffer persecution. You will be considered a bad Roman citizen. You will have problems at home with your family who do not understand why you are no longer worshiping the gods that they grew up with. You may lose your job. You may lose your income because you have chosen to follow Christ. Now, here in the United States, when we talk about faith, we sort of miss the whole point. And we oftentimes use the word faith like the word belief. Here's a list of things that you must believe. This is your faith, this list of beliefs. You have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You have to believe that he rose from the dead. You have to believe that in a virgin birth. You have to believe that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God. We have this whole list of beliefs that you must have, and we worry that somehow somebody else might convince you that one of those beliefs is not true, and then you're going to lose your faith. I can't tell you how many times I was warned about going to seminary. Don't go to seminary. A lot of people lose their faith when they go to seminary. They get studying all this stuff, and the liberals have gone in there, and the deceivers and the false teachers are all in these seminaries, and a lot of people end up losing their faith. And what they're really saying is, your beliefs might change. And we tend to equate faith with beliefs, but that's not what it is. Good morning, Open Door Ministries, and to all our Lord friends and family on Facebook and YouTube. It's good to be together again this Sunday. I love what he says here. Increase and abound in love. Increase and abound in love. The picture in Greek is of overflowing. Think of this glass just overflowing. That love should literally be overflowing out of us and spilling out everywhere. Not only on each other, not only for the church members that we get together with on a Sunday, but for everyone. Every person we encounter should be experiencing this overflow of love from us. And yet, I would say nine times out of 10, most of our encounters with other Christians are not necessarily pleasant. I can't tell you how much infighting goes on in churches. Now I've been involved in ministry since I was 17 years old, and I've been to half a dozen different churches, and I've seen infighting, and people just rip each other. They do not have love for one another. It does not abound. Oftentimes what I see is a battle of wills between what this group wants and what that group wants. And they both, they both think, well, this is what God and the Holy Spirit is telling us must happen. And it's not. We oftentimes use God and the movement of the Holy Spirit to justify our own wants and desires. 
But the thing that God really wants is for us to love one another. Oh, well, the carpet needs to be this color because the Holy Spirit is telling me this is the color it needs to be. You know what? It's better to have a bare floor and people living together in unity and harmony than a new fresh carpet. I've seen so many arguments about facilities and they're ridiculous arguments. Unity is more important than the facility. We need to love one another and we need to love others. Oh, one of the things that bothers me the most is when I go out and I'm, I see street preachers, I do not agree with street preachers at all. I don't like street preachers. I think they do more harm for Christianity than they do good. I have seen street pe preachers accost people. They stand up there with their signs that are highly offensive and their little bullhorns and they are accosting people. And they call people horrible names. I've seen street preachers go to events like uh, pride celebrations for the LGBT plus community. And they yell at these people, you dyke, you fag, you're going to hell, you're going to burn. And when you ask them about this, you say, why are you doing it this way? You are offensive. Well, the word of God is offensive. And you say, you don't need to be so rude. I have to get their attention. But this is unloving. The most loving thing I can do is tell them that they're going to hell. No, it's not. That's not the most loving thing to do. How about put down the sign, put down the bullhorn, put down your lousy little attitude, stop being offensive, and show a little love. Moving on. Love should be overflowing from us like it overflows from a glass. And this is what he's saying, in these difficult times, in these times when you are suffering persecution, if love is overflowing from you, trust me, the persecution stops. Pliny the Elder wrote a letter to the Emperor Trajan. Christians were being persecuted. They were actually putting Christians to death. And he's like, I don't understand why we're persecuting them. What are they doing that's so bad? You know, they get together and they make certain promises to each other. They promise not to steal. They promise that if they hold something as security for a loan, that they will return it. They're promising to be good people. They're doing good works. They're showing love. So I'm not like seeking them out. I'm not trying to hunt them down to persecute them. They seem to be doing a lot of good in our society. And the emperor wrote back, yeah, that's a good decision. Don't seek them out. Don't hunt them down. I mean, if they fall into your jurisdiction and you have to prosecute them, then do it. But don't go out of your way to hunt them down. Christians were doing so much good in that society from the love that was overflowing from them that even the officials were like going, I don't know why we'd want to persecute them. They're such nice people. When's the last time you heard here in the United States Man, those Christians, they're such great people. They're so nice. They're so loving. Who could not like them? In fact, I'm thinking about becoming one. That doesn't happen. You know what happens nowadays? Christians are so judgmental. Christians are so anti-everything. Oh, those Christians, all they care about is money. And Christianity has received a bad rap. And oftentimes, the Christian leaders go, well, we're being persecuted. No, you're not being persecuted. You're being critiqued. People look at you and go, there's no love there. I don't want to be like that. You've just got critiqued, not persecuted. Paul continues on. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And this word holiness is one of those words in American Christianity that sort of lost all its meaning. We don't understand the word holiness. It's another one of those words that has a lot of depth and nuance to it. And so let's talk about what holiness actually is. You know, when we think about holiness, we tend to think of that movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And for my millennials and my Zoomers who have not seen that movie, Netflix it, please, so you can see it and you'll know what I'm talking about. But there's a scene at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. They have found the Ark of the Covenant and they go to open it and out comes all this fire and power and all this kind of stuff. And it burns up and destroys everyone. And we tend to think that's holiness. Some kind of bright light, some kind of fire, some kind of power, some kind of force. And that's not what holiness is. Holiness is being set apart. Holiness is being different. Holiness 
and especially in this particular verse, because it doesn't talk about this process of being set apart. It doesn't talk about the process of being different. It talks about this as your actual goal. This is the goal of the process. Holiness is similar to a very technical theological term we have called sanctification, which is the process of becoming more Christ-like, of being cleaned up and transformed into the image of Christ. And holiness is the goal of that transformation. It's the end point of sanctification. It's Christ-likeness. That's what holiness is. When you are like Christ, you are holy. When you have been transformed into the image of Christ, then you are set apart. Then you are different and unique. Then you are holy. And it's not piety. Now, Americans love their piety. It's the outward trappings of Christianity. Oh, the Puritans were great at it. Our early Methodists were great at piety, right? We love our piety, acting all churchy. You know, I dress up to go to church. I carry the big Bible, and it's the right Bible, too. It's a King James, because I'm a King James only kind of guy. And I don't drink, and I don't smoke, and I don't gamble, and I don't go with women who do. And I'm in church every time the doors open, three times a week, and I go to the prayer meetings, too, and I pray three hours a day. I get up at four in the morning so I can pray three hours a day. And I let no unclean thing come before my eye. I won't go to movies that aren't G-rated. I don't read books unless they're Christian books. I don't listen to music unless it's Christian music. Very pious, and it sounds really nice. And it's all a bunch of, I was about to use a really bad word there, but I'm being pious and I won't say it. That's not what our transformation is. That's all the outward stuff. I can't tell you I grew up in churches that put huge lists of do's and don'ts on me. Piety, mere piety. And how frustrating. I can't tell you how frustrating that was. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Don't gamble. Don't have sex. Don't touch yourself. Don't look at this. Don't look at that. Stay away from this place. Stay away from that place. That was all the list of the don'ts and there were the list of do's. You need to come to church. You need to be there Sunday and for Sunday school and for the evening service on Sunday and the Wednesday mid-group. And you need to come to the Tuesday prayer meeting and the Thursday prayer meeting. And you need to volunteer your time. You need to do all this other stuff. Well, you can be an usher. You can clean up afterwards. You can do this. You can do that. Uh, work, 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 work. Be at church 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's mere piety. I was doing that because I was afraid of hell. If I don't do all these things the church tells me to do, oh my gosh, God's going to get mad at me and zap me or he's going to send me to hell or I'm not a real Christian or I'm not on fire for Christ. That's not transformation. It wasn't transforming me. All I became was somebody who was busy and worried. Am I doing enough? I want transformation. I want to become more like Christ. That's holiness and that's what we need during these difficult times. If you're under persecution, if you were under persecutions like those first century Christians, you need to be Christ-like. Because Christ did not respond to violence with violence, he would lay down his life for another. Christ would heal wherever he went. Christ would forgive wherever he went. I want to be like Christ. Christ loved everyone. Everyone. He wasn't exclusive. He didn't say, well, I'll just take these male disciples. He had female disciples. I'll take the female disciples too. You know what? You leper over there, you're in with this group too. Oh, yeah, yeah, you tax collector, you big old, yeah, the big old sinners are part of this group. Oh, you, you prostitutes, yeah, you're part of this group too. We're all included. And we need to be all inclusive in that, like that in our church too. And we're not. We need to be transformed to become more Christ-like. So here's what Paul's praying for them. I want you to abound in love. I want love to be overflowing out of you that no matter where you go, it begins to touch everybody. And I want you to be more Christ-like, which if you ask me, are really the same things. In difficult times, that's really what's needed. We need to understand that in order to live this out, in order to do this in our real life, to worship God by living this out in our actual lives, to be successful during these difficult times, 
we need to understand that Christianity isn't a civil religion. Civil religions, that's what the Romans had. You were expected as a citizen to worship a certain way and do certain things. You had to go worship the emperor, throw a little incense on his altar, say Caesar is God and walk away. It's a civil religion. That's not what Christianity is. Christianity is not about piousness. Christianity is not about sitting in pews, if you're an old school church, or sitting in chairs, if you're a little more hip, or sitting on couches, if you're the big, you know, fabulous new mega church emerging kind of thing. It's not about reading from hymnals or singing worship songs. I mean, I love worship songs. I tend to like the hymns myself. But it's not about all the exteriors. It's not about a civil religion. It's about a journey of personal transformation that results in Christ living and acting through us. Holiness. It's about when I encounter every person, they encounter Christ in me. When I encounter every person, they encounter love in me. How can you not fall in love with Christ? You know, a lot of people who have left the church, they say, I really like Jesus. I like Jesus. I like what he taught. I just don't like his followers. And I agree with them. Some of his followers are really terrible because they're not Christ-like. They haven't been transformed. They're very pious, but they're not Christ-like. They're not holy. The evidence of this transformation, the evidence that we have become holy is love in action. You can talk about, oh, I just love them. Yeah, would you leave them on the street? I just love them, but I'm not going to give them any money. They're just going to spend it on drugs and alcohol. Well, how about giving them a sandwich or something? <sighs> and you have to be towards everyone, not just towards my family, not just towards people I like, not just towards people who like me, not just towards my church, but to everyone, to every person I encounter. Every person. That means the Buddhists, the Muslims, the Jews, the Blacks, the Latinos, the gays, the lesbians, the transgender, everyone. Everyone must be included in this love or it's not real love. It's mere piety and show. Everyone. To be successful in difficult times, love must overflow. You want to change this church? You want to change the church in America? Let love overflow out of you. Because when people encounter love, they want more and they want to become part of it. They want to get involved. They're like, I don't know what's going on with you, but I want to get involved. My mother tells an interesting story. Now, my mom was raised Catholic, but she was divorced. She divorced her first husband. It was a bad situation. She divorced her first husband. And as such, she was shunned within the Catholic Church for her divorce. I'm sure things have changed now. She's just merely telling about her experience from the past. In the past, that's kind of the way that they acted. I think some churches still do it today. I think it's not just Catholic churches, but it's all kinds of churches who do it today. But she had been shunned. She was considered an outcast. When she met my father, my father proposed and they decided to get married. It was a little dicey because a lot of the Christian Protestant churches, and especially the Baptist church where my father was attending at that time, and my grandmother was a deaconess there. My great-grandfather and great-grandmother were missionaries from the Baptist church. They did not approve of divorce and remarriage. But an interesting thing happened. My great-grandmother knew that my mom needed a place to stay while she finished wrapping up her divorce before she could marry my dad. And so my great-grandmother invited her to her home in Redondo Beach to stay there. And it was while she was staying there, she saw something within my great-grandmother. She saw my great-grandmother showing love and care for other human beings. And my mom said, 
you know what? I was raised this way, but I'm seeing something in you. That is what I want. I want to become and follow Jesus like you're following Jesus. She saw a light and she saw a love within my great-grandmother that drew her towards it. And so she ended up getting baptized within the Baptist church because of the love that she saw in my great-grandmother. Why isn't that happening with us today? Why aren't we demonstrating such love towards every person that they are drawn to it? Why aren't we serving others in such a loving way that they want to know why? Can't we get rid of just shouting at people and telling people how terrible they are and condemning people and trying to scare people with hell and damnation? How about we just show a little love? To be successful in difficult times, love must overflow from us. Church isn't, and I'm about to say this, and this will sound a little weird, church isn't about plop, pray, pay. Plop, pray, pay. This actually comes from an article I read. It's somebody who was doing some research on duns, people who are done with church, people who've walked away from church, people who will never set foot in a church again. They like Jesus. They just hate church, and they're done with church. And these were the words that came from the people that they were interviewing about these duns. He said, why are you done with church? What's wrong with church? And so many of them are like, I'm done with plop, pray, and pay. You come into church, you plop down in the pews, or the chairs, or the couches, whatever it is, right? You plop down, you pray, and then you pay into the little collection plate as it goes by. We're tired of the outward piety. We're tired of going through the motions. And they're seeking something more. That's why so many of them now describe themselves as, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Because they're seeking, they're seeking transformation. Our very souls call out to God, trying to find Him. Our very souls want to return home to God. We were made in the image of God. We realize there's something wrong. We realize we need transformation. And so many people are seeking it, but they're not seeking it within the church because the church has failed them. So what do I want you to do? Well, I want you to go and just do. You go and do. So many people, they try to get involved in the church. They can't find the transformation. They even try to serve in a church, and the church won't let them serve. They're like, okay, well, we'll need like a, a guiding ministry statement for whatever you want to start doing, and uh, we'll need to get a committee together, and we'll have to authorize it, and, and it'll be like, oh, six, eight months before we can even get whatever ministry you want to do started. People are like, I don't need all, I just, I just want to help. Why do I need all these extra steps? So I'm going to tell you, just go and do it. Notice I put you in there. You go and do let me share from a pastor's heart. I have so many people who come to me and they go, oh, I have this great idea for ministry. And I'm like, terrific. I love great ideas for ministry. I think the church should blah, 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 blah. And they'll come up with something. I've been told all kinds of crazy stuff. I think the church needs a cowbell choir. Great. Start it. Oh, no, I'm thinking you should start it. I don't even own a cowbell. I don't want to play cowbell. Right? Trust me, I have enough work. I know exactly what God has called me to do, and I stand very fast in what God has called me to do. I don't need you to come up with new ideas of work I should be doing. So, you have an idea for ministry, be empowered, you go and do it, whatever it is. Is it PBJ? Peanut butter and jelly? I use this example. This is from my experience, the little short-term missionary trips that I would take down to Mexico. Oftentimes, I would take youth down to Mexico, junior hires and high schoolers, sometimes college students. We would go down to Mexico and we'd do service projects in Mexico, in some of the very poor, very rural parts of Mexico, not in the city, in the very rural areas of Mexico. And I remember in one little tiny village, basically, you might call it a town, it wasn't very big, that all the children would leave where they were living and they would begin to walk towards the school. And along that main street, along that road that they would all pass, was an old woman. And every morning she would get up early before school would start and she knew what time the kids would start walking past her house and she would literally make 
a hundred or more peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every freaking morning. She would get up and she'd start making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And as the kids walked by her house, she'd give them one because they're hungry, because these kids were hungry. Many of these kids had not had breakfast that morning because their parents were poor. And she would just hand them a sandwich. Here's a sandwich, here's a sandwich. And then they could go to school because oftentimes if the children had not eaten by the time they got into school, the teachers and the administrators would send the kids back home because hungry kids tended not to learn and tended to be disruptive. And so she made sure that each and every one of these children could go to school. She didn't need the approval of a church. She didn't need a ministry statement. She didn't need special organizations and, and committees and all this kind of stuff. Just every morning she got up and she made sandwiches. That was it. If that's on your heart, if you want to give socks to the homeless, if you want to pass out donuts, to, I don't care. Just go do it. You don't need permission. If you think you need permission, you have mine. Go and do it. Anybody ask you, well, who gave you permission? Tell them I gave you permission. You don't need a title. We get so caught up on titles. Well, you know, I want to be a pastor, you know, and I'd have to be a pastor to do that. You don't need any special title, deacon, elder. That's, that's just all stuff. That's just organizational stuff, hierarchical stuff. You don't need a special title. You don't need an organization. You don't need all of that. You just want to hand out bottles of cold water somewhere. Just hand them out. Just do whatever it is that you need to do. I remember in Nala, on one of our short-term mission trips, we asked the lady, is there anything that you need? You need more? We were thinking bread or cases of peanut butter or, or jelly. Can we bring the supplies you need? To, you know, that's not what she asked for. You know what she asked for? It was kind of funny what she asked for. She said, could I get some benches? I need some benches out front of my house, you know, so the kids can sit down and eat they would all just stand around out there in the street. You know, it'd be nice to have some benches. And so the kids and I built a whole bunch of benches. I mean, we built, I don't know, probably 15, 20 benches. I was surprised the next year when we went back, the benches were still standing because I made a couple of those and I am no carpenter. I'm like, wow, look, they're still held together. I'm sure they probably repaired them multiple times. Do you need to make benches for somebody? Somebody needs a bench? You can make a bench, make a bench. Somebody needs their car fixed? You can fix it, fix it for them. Toilets need to be cleaned. You're a plumber. You know how to fix a toilet. Fix it for them. You don't need any special blessing or commission or anointing or anything like that. Just show a little love. Just go and do. Because you need to be the visible body of Christ today. Christ met people and he saw their need and he met their need. When 5,000 people were hungry, Jesus fed them. He didn't get the disciples together and go, we need a mission statement, and let's form a committee. And let... He fed them. He didn't decide whether or not they were worthy or unworthy. He didn't check their immigration status. He didn't check to see if they were alcoholics. He didn't check to see if he was empowering their awful lifestyle that made them hungry. No, he just saw a need, and he took care of that need. You see a need, just go and take care of it. That's love overflowing. See a need, take care of the need. Be the answer to the prayer that another person has. And when we as Christians begin to act in this way, when love overflows from us, Christianity's reputation is going to change. And we'll see people coming back to the church. We'll see people coming back going, I want to be like that. You know, I see you out there handing out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Can I do that too? Yes, you can. Come on up here. Start making some. That's what we need during these difficult times. Right now, during this pandemic, we are suffering from social isolation. And there are so many people who just need to hear an encouraging word. Pick up your phone and call them. Send them a card. 
for my millennials and my Zoomers, a card, you buy them in stores, you put them in the mailbox, that's some guy comes and gets it and carries it over there by hand instead of an email. We can do these things. And they're all acts of love where we become the visible body of Christ in the world today. People will see Christ because they see it in us. And that's how we need to change. I put a picture up here. Take a look at this picture. Look at this face for a second. Because this is the face of Christ. This is a woman who works in a soup kitchen. She goes there every day. She goes there every day after her work. She cooks dinner every day. You probably didn't know Jesus wears a hairnet. But this is the face of Christ. This is love overflowing. This is holiness right in front of you. Probably nobody ever walks past her in the kitchen and thinks, I am now standing upon holy ground. I am now standing in the presence of holiness. But there it is, holiness manifested in front of you, the face of Christ in front of you at this very moment. And we need to do the same in whatever way that we can. We need to do the same. Let love overflow and be holy. That's it for this week. Until we have a chance to meet again, may you go in peace. borrowed this one because I thought it uh, conveyed the message of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 very well. The first part, keep calm, relates to the second half of the uh, chapter, and carry on relates to the first half of the chapter. The Boston Molasses Flood of 1919. Interesting enough, uh, Boston would be going through the Spanish pandemic of uh, 1818, the Spanish flu pandemic. This is a congregation who under persecution was thriving and growing and loving one another. And Paul is saying, keep doing that. Ancient views of sexuality are not the same as modern views. And this is where we get into a lot of trouble. We have to understand that when Paul wrote this and his audience read it, they understood sexuality in a completely different way than we understand sexuality now. I know that there are a lot of folks who struggle as our views on sexuality begin to change. And we are beginning to recognize that sexuality is a lot more fluid and a lot broader than we thought before.